two panelists are beating the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 2003, with the average panelist portfolio up more than 20 percent, or well over twice as much as the Dow. And even that impressively rewarding performance looks like chump change compared with the results of the super stock picking of the four aces you'll be seeing on our program tonight. We'll be trying to do it again for your profit over the next six months. We'll also be looking at the economy for the past six months and the next to see whether all this sudden market cheerfulness can be sustained. You remember the economy, don't you? Actually, one of the best things the market has had going for it over the past few months is that investors have remained so nervous and downright skeptical over their recently unfamiliar good fortune. The airwaves, for example, were full of frightened explanations today for why the major averages were down for the week. Largely ignored was what may be the most plausible answer, that even the best of markets, and we ain't quite there yet, has to take a breath now and then. Consider that this has already been the best quarter since 1998 for the S&P 500 and for world stock markets generally. That the S&P had been up for nine of the previous 10 weeks and that even with this week's perfectly normal profit taking, the Dow is ahead by nearly a quarter since last October's lows and NASDAQ by nearly a half. I don't want to disappoint anybody, but folks, I guarantee you, they're not going to keep that up forever. Sorry about that. But if this year's second half is even remotely as good for the markets as the past six months, all those perennial gloomsters who, after decades of failure, have been getting so much reverent attention during the downturn, may soon find themselves back on the typical investor's do not call list at least from here to Halloween. The Dow Jones Industrial Average slipped back to just below 9,000, but it, like the S&P 500, is still on track for a fourth straight monthly gain, their first set streaks in about four and a half years. And while most of the broader indexes also gave back a bit this week, the resurgent NASDAQ is headed, with one trading day still to go, for its fifth straight monthly advance and its best spring quarter ever. The Federal Reserve's decision this week to cut interest rates by just a quarter percent instead of the half for which many bond investors were yearning sent treasuries sharply down for the week. It was a double whammy for the bond ghouls who reacted with characteristic horror to a number of reports suggesting that there might at last be some fire in the ashes of the burnt out economy. If you can imagine anything worse than that. Similar perceptions that the U.S. growth rate may be about to accelerate help the dollar strengthen to its best levels in weeks against other major currencies. And in the weirdest surfacing of the week, the former Iraqi information minister who became a figure of ridicule for his daily briefings claiming that everything was going great for Saddam Hussein re-emerged on Arab television. It was not confirmed that he will soon have another job as a bearish financial commentator, explaining that all reports of steeply rising stock prices since last October are just total fictions invented by infidels in the Pentagon to deceive you. Tom Gallagher, is this market ready for a significant retreat? I don't think it's in for a retreat, but I think that the gains we've seen so far are going to reflect most of the gains that we're probably going to see for the year. I think the, the second quarter was all about pricing in a response by the economy to all the stimulus that we've seen from tax cuts and interest rate cuts and a weak dollar. And so now the question is, will the market, will the economy validate what the market has uh, priced in? Well, I think the economy is going to improve. I, I'm not sure it's going to, going to improve by much more than the market has already priced in. So you think we've had most of the good news at the front end. That wouldn't be unusual for the start of a bull market after a bear market, though, would it? Well, that's true, but I'm, I'm not really sure we're in uh, a full-fledged bull market here. I, I, my expectation is more for a market return in the kind of mid-single digits, a little below the historical average. So that's why I'm a little more cautious in the second half of the year, given the strength of the second quarter. If it's not a bull market, what is it? A yeah, trading range. If you're looking for a short answer, it used to be a trading range environment. Leslie Brini, what's your view? Well, it's been an extraordinary market, and I don't think most people appreciate how strong it's been. Since the bottom, only 10 of the 500 S&P stocks are down. 
And so some sort of retreat, consolidation, or more, I think, of a shakeout because the market's been so broad that we haven't really discriminated between financial value, growth, or whatever. And so that shakeout may cause some hesitation, but I think the market goes higher. Well, how, how does a shakeout differ from a correction? Because I think you start to discern the shape of the coming market, whether it's one driven by rates, whether it's one driven by growth in the economy, whether it's one where value stocks uh, come to the fore. So far, it's been the proverbial rising tide, and everything's done well. Now I think we'll start to see some stocks slip back and then some other stocks assert themselves. Do you call it a bull market? Oh, yes. Kim Goodwin, how about you? Is it a bull market? <laughs> I'm a bull. I think we're in the early stages of a bull well, you're market. You're a bull, but it's the market. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we are in the early stages of a bull market. Equities are still attractive in, in spite of the run-up. If you look at the earnings yield on the S&P 500, roughly a little bit over 5% versus the earnings yield on treasuries at you know 2.5%, equities are still attractive. I'd still be interested in buying them. You've touched on the uh, most controversial point of all, which is, is the market under or overvalued? How do you come down on that? You know, I think it's possible that, as, as Tom pointed out, that we could take a breather. The difference between the first half and the second half, in my opinion, is that equities led, and that's what you would expect. In the second half, it's entirely possible that the economic recover and equities trade the same way. But the risk is that they surprise us both on the upside in the second half. That'd be a nice risk. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Roger McNamee, you don't think it's that good, do you? Well, I would love it. If, uh, if it was that good. But, Lou, I think that the market's been too democratic on the way up. Is that lowercase? Exactly. <laughs> I think that you've seen stocks, especially on the NASDAQ, go up uniformly in anticipation of an economic recovery that is still in front of us. And I'm very bullish longer term. I agree that we are in a bull market. I just think that it's important to be much more selective than the markets have been for the year to date. We're always being told that it's the time to be selective, and I prefer that to being non-selective. We also were told that it wouldn't be just a dartboard experience, but it seems to have been the last few months. In indeed it has, and I think that is in anticipation of a widespread economic recovery that followed a period of time where everyone in the market, every company, had to adjust its business model and get its cost structure right. So they expect operating leverage throughout the economy, and they expect to see a recovery of earnings everywhere. It's just some people are going to recover a lot better than others, especially in the technology world that I cover. So you think that uh, things are heading upward, but by no means uniformly so? No, that's right. And I think we'll have volatility for the rest of this year, but I think next year is a much better year uh, than where we are right now, and maybe a year comparable to what we saw in 2003. Well, that's why we have you people here to tell us exactly where the money should go. Well, now before we look ahead with four of the year's best financial performers. Let's review where we've been in six months in which the stock market gave a pretty good imitation of the comeback kid. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which held up better than the broad indexes during the downturn, has underperformed them so far this year, but has still gained nearly 8%, while the other major indexes, led by the reawakened NASDAQ, all managed double-digit advances in the first six months. And for all the talk about the big comeback of gold, the metal actually has lost a couple of bucks an ounce this year. And silver has given up a tad, too. Despite its recent bounce, the no longer almighty dollar has lost ground this year against all its major competitors except the Japanese yen. Meanwhile, back at the economy, the short and shallow recession of 2001, a three-quarter long decline in the nation's gross domestic product adjusted for inflation, continues to be followed by an anemic recovery. Growth for the four quarters that ended March 31st was just over three and a quarter percent, and the annual rate has lately been notably lower. The good news for consumers has been the continued absence of anything resembling severe inflation. The consumer price index rose just over 2% in the last 12 months. But unemployment was an increasing worry for Americans. This traditionally lagging indicator reached its recent peak just over 6% in May. The Federal Reserve's ultra-easy money policy continued to make Treasury bonds major winners as the yield on the benchmark 10-year note is down to just over 3.5%. Short-term yields nearly disappeared under the Fed's pressure. To the distress of many conservative savers, the average yield on even taxable money market funds has fallen to below two-thirds of a percentage point. With a quick end to at least the official war in Iraq, 
and the worldwide economic slowdown, the price of oil is retreated, retreated back below $30 a barrel. And the U.S. trade deficit continues unabated. The last time the U.S. saw even a monthly trade surplus, our president was Gerald Ford. None of the above has done much for consumer confidence, but lately it's been picking up a bit with worries about current unemployment balanced against rising expectations of future economic improvement. And where do we go from here? The conference board's index of leading economic indicators has lately been pointing strongly upward for a change as optimism begins to make a comeback. Tom Gallagher, which of these numbers, if any, is the one to watch for the next six months? The one I like to watch, if you just had to pick one, is, is the initial unemployment claims number. Not the unemployment rate, which that comes out monthly, but initial unemployment claims comes out uh, once a week. Not only does it tell you what the labor market looks like, but it's really a broader measure of business confidence. If businesses are confident enough to be hiring more workers, they're probably going to start spending money on capital spending, and that's really the key to a, a more sustainable recovery. And what's it telling us now? Right now it's been improving a little bit, but the rule of thumb is when the initial unemployment claims are above 400,000, it's a sign of a weak economy, and this week it was at 404,000, if I remember the number right. So it's, it's still signaling weakness, but it's, uh, the trend is improving. Do you think the unemployment rate will be down next year? Probably not. The problem with the, the, for the labor market is that the economy is so productive. Uh, that, the, that the economy can grow at uh, 3% uh, entirely with the existing workforce. So you could see this uh, irony where the economy is growing, but unemployment continues to rise. Lazo Brandy, what are you going to be watching? Consumer confidence, uh, not only in the numbers, but in the actions of investors, because investors have been coming back to this market, even though the numbers may not support the rationale for doing so. People want to get back in the market again. And as long as they want to do that, I think we're, we're going to be okay. Well, you're distinguishing investor confidence from what is normally thought of as consumer confidence. I am. And that's why I'm not sure the consumer confidence number per se is what you look at, but it's just how people feel about things. Well, you have been notable over the years for watching the flow of funds into the market, which is one important index of investor confidence. What is it telling you? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, one is that uh, short selling is increasing. So there's a lot of people out there who still don't believe it. But uh, obviously, when you look at the assets of money market funds and flows to mutual funds, the public is coming back. Is the public usually wrong, as the syndics suggest? Uh, no, I think the, historically the old odd lot theory uh, did have some uh, value. But uh, today, with all the information and with people like yourselves, the public is much better informed. People like myself, hmm? Didn't know there were any. <laughs> Kim Goodwin, what are you watching? <laughs> I'm paying attention to corporate profits, but mainly because it's a leading indicator of business spending. So looking at the durable goods orders, for example, they were a little bit weak, but what, can, what you may be missing as an investor is that uh, they've been selectively strong, for example, in consumer and electronics areas. We've seen some interesting spending increases. So you think the consumer is uh, in pretty good shape still? Uh, they still are. It's been a surprise. For, from my perspective, it's been the surprise of this year, and some of it's fueled by refinancing activity. Roger, what are you watching? Well, you know, Lou, I'm watching all the same things the other panelists are, but to me it all comes down to the economy. We can't have a good stock market going forward if fundamentals don't begin to catch up, and I think that reflects itself in gross domestic product. The GDP number is a lagging indicator, and lately the revisions have been largely unfavorable, which tell you the thing that I think we need to pay attention to now, which is that earnings have not been as strong, fundamentals are not as strong as stock prices. So you want to see some of that growth that you keep talking about? That's exactly correct, and you're going to see it in all of these numbers. All righty, now comes the moment of truth when we turn the spotlight on what these folks said six months ago, and what has been for decades the toughest competition in investing. The list cannot be changed for any reason during the ensuing 12 months. The results of following the stock pickers on this program over the years have been truly remarkable, as was confirmed this year in still another academic study, this one published in the Financial Analyst Journal. I have never stressed this because I always want you to remember that nobody bats a thousand in this business. But this year has certainly been wonderfully memorable according to the latest calculations by our friends at Wilshire Associates. Tom Gallagher, you have lately threatened to become unstoppable. After you led the pack last year with an astounding 84% gain, you're doing it again this year with a list that's ahead by more than 47% over the past six months. If this keeps up, you may have a career in this business. You also, incidentally, were the only one of the four here tonight whose high prediction for the NASDAQ this year has not already been exceeded. An overly bearish fate they shared with fully half our 22 panelists. Laszlo Brini, your stock picks were in second place for the first five months of the year. 
the basis on which we issued invitations for tonight's program. But Lou Holland has since surged into that position with a 39% gain. Still, you held the next position comfortably. Your list now shows a total six-month return of nearly 38%, which is not exactly chopped liver. So congratulations to you. Kim Goodwin, in the past 24 hours, you've moved ahead of Roger McNamee. <laughs> And your picks now show an impressive return of nearly 35% so far this year, onward and upward. Roger, you're just about a point behind that, which is not bad for a young fella who doubles on weekends as a rock musician with the Flying Other Brothers Band. Lou, I, all I can do is try to do my best each quarter to catch up to Kim. There you go. <laughs> I can't say to you, though, let's all get down. <laughs> and now in our regular triumph of hope over experience. Let's hear from each of you the true inside word on the highest close, the lowest close, and the final close for both the Dow and NASDAQ in 2003. And this time, gang, let's get it all exactly right. Tom? I think for the Dow, the high will be 9,900, the low 7,600, the close 9,400. For the NASDAQ, the high of 1,800, low of 1,230, and a close of 1,450. So you think we got a little left in us? A little bit of the Dow, uh, not, not as confident on the NASDAQ. Laszlo? Well, I think we've seen the low in the indexes. So I think the Dow goes up to about 9,800, and has a possibility of going down to 8,500 before moving higher. NASDAQ uh, could go How about up. the close? Uh, the close, I'm sorry, the, the close, it's going to close near the high. But, uh, NASDAQ, I think it's around the, it also has made its low. I think it gets to around the 1,800 level. Uh, it may go back uh, about five percent from here, and I think it closes near the 1800 level. Kim? Dow, high, um, 9500. We've seen the lows, and I think that the close is going to be closer to, to the 9400 level. Um, with the NASDAQ, uh, I think that the highs are going to be in the 1700 range. We've seen the lows, and the close is probably going to be 1650. Roger. I'm with Kim again. I'm going to try to stay close to her. I'm at about <laughs> 9,500 for the high on the Dow. Again, I agree with her that we've seen the lows, and I believe it will close on the high. With NASDAQ, I'm looking for a 1750 high. Uh, I think we've seen the lows again, and I believe it will also close around 1750 at the high. Just because you two agree doesn't mean you're wrong. Well, it would be a first <laughs> if I weren't. <laughs> One thing's for sure, this is my only personal guarantee of the night, some of them will be wrong. And now let's ask these fabulous four for a handful of new investment recommendations for the next six months. Tom? Well, all of mine stem from what's going on in Congress right now, which is the, the Medicare drug benefit. I think that it is going to be enacted, and it'll be especially beneficial for drug distributors like Cardinal Health Systems. I think even though the generic companies like Milan Labs have had a pretty good run, I think they still have some benefits ahead of them. The big question is what it means for the pharmaceuticals like, like Pfizer. They've run up. They'll probably continue to run up while Congress considers this, but I'm leery of the long-term prospects here. I think once a sector becomes a ward of the state, uh, it'll be hard to justify high multiples. The last comment here is I think the bond market is in for a negative if they pass this. The, the, the cost of this is going to be entirely borrowed. Uh, it's going to be paid for entirely by borrowing. You mean when the government helps an industry, it generally goes downhill? Well, uh, you have to ask the hospitals what it's like to depend on the government for a meaningful share of your revenues. Laszlo? Well, I'm terribly embarrassed because the stocks that I liked, I thought we were going to do better in the second half, not the first half. And I haven't had a very chance to we're buy We're outraged that you had the success too early. <laughs> yeah. uh, but going forward, uh, uh, I think uh, something like Verizon, I like stocks which give you a little bit of dividends. So Verizon gives you over 3%. Um, stock like uh, City uh, Group, I think, still has more room on the upside. And then uh, Baxter Labs uh, in the healthcare area, I think, is a stock that uh, I would be buying here. Well, uh, you, you and Tom both showing a lot of interest in the healthcare area. Is that because of legislation or not? In my case, it's just that they've lagged. Uh, the interest has uh, been elsewhere. And uh, mostly, and uh, also, there's some dividend play, which uh, in, a, in a market with a lot of volatility, I always like to have a little bit of uh, safety. What are you selling? Uh, I'm a little concerned about the financial stocks, uh, especially uh, the brokerage stocks. Uh, despite the fact that they have very good earnings, uh, they've given back about 10 or 15 percent this week, and I thought they got very much ahead of themselves. They most of them went up 50 percent in the rally. You own these stocks? Uh, I own Bristol Myers and Verizon. How about you, Tom? Just through mutual funds, not directly. Mm -hmm. Kim? 
Two of the names that I would recommend for the second half are names that have significantly lagged their peers in, in technology and also in consumer discretionary. Disney is one that's fairly controversial. I think that investors are underestimating the potential positive impact from ESPN and also ES, ESPN high def line extensions. Microsoft has got $42 billion in cash to put to work, and I hope to find out next month what they're going to do with it. <laughs> and then a third name, Amdocs, which is a billing software and services company that's getting more contracts with wireless carriers. I own all three of these names through the State Street Research Mutual Funds. Three picks for what you see as a Mickey Mouse market. <laughs> <laughs> right. Lou, I think the most important thing in technology right now is to own market leaders who are gaining market share, and I would cite three, Flextronics in the contract manufacturing business, Cisco in data networking, and Intuit in consumer and small business financial software. You emphasized at the beginning that you thought we had to be selective, with, particularly within technology, so what are you deselecting at this point? I, I just believe that the semiconductor capital equipment and semiconductor areas are the places where stocks are most ahead of themselves, and I think quite candidly at the moment, you want to keep your technology portfolio very narrowly focused. The semiconductors have done better than you thought they would this year. They have indeed, and fortunately we adjusted our portfolio behavior during the year, but uh, I think we've gotten most of what we're going to get. But you own all these stocks you mentioned? We do. I only mention names The buys and the sales? I, well, I would <laughs> love to tell you that I did, but uh, we just own the longs. You emphasized to us that you thought next year might be a much better year than this year. Tell us a little more about why you feel that way. The technology sector is going through what we call the new normal. It's got a rebirth uh, to a much more traditional, slow-growing, earn it, grind it out kind of economy. But the good news is technology is pervasive now. And I just think that as you see employment rise and the economy improve, tech stocks are going to do great. But you need advice, not a dartboard. Exactly. And I think you, consumers are in a per perfect position because consumer technology is the biggest growth area that's out there, and our viewers are in great shape. Well, thanks very much to four very good sports. Next week, my guest will be one of the greatest market historians of the past century, a man who is still giving highly respected investment advice for the next, the legendary Ned Davis, the founder and boss of Ned Davis Research, will give us his take on where we've just been, where we're likely to be heading next, and precisely where you, sh you should be putting your money now to stay ahead of the crowd. Meanwhile, this has been Louis Rukeyser's Wall Street. Good night.